I've got this desk set up because I'm going to share some thoughts with you here at the beginning. And afterwards, we're going to have a panel of experts up here. And they all happen to be young, but they're all gifted evangelists. We're going to have Jason Powell, who spoke last Thursday night, who goes out on the street and shares his faith and leads people to Christ left and right. We're also going to have Chad Williams, who you've heard from before. Chad is a former Navy SEAL. And uh, he, he is a bold witness for Christ. He's out on the streets. He does street preaching, leads people to the Lord. And finally, Jonathan Lorry, my son. Jonathan goes up once a month to the Fred Jordan Mission. And his congregation are the people of Skid Row. So uh, he gets out there and shares his faith with them as well. So they're going to take your questions. And some have already come in. And we've got some great questions already. So they're going to answer those. So we want you guys to be thinking about this, and you can still text that number with maybe a hard question that you've been asked that you didn't know the answer to because we want to help you have the answers you need. Uh, my contact lens isn't working too well tonight, so I'm going to wear glasses. Do I look more intelligent to you? <laughs> no, okay. Thank you very much. All right, so let's grab our Bibles, and uh, we're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the title of this little talk is Answering Difficult Questions Non-Believers Ask. Well, if you're out sharing your faith, it won't be long until somebody comes and asks you a hard question. So you have to be prepared for that. Now you have to understand, a lot of times when people ask you as a Christian the hard question, it's not because they actually want an answer to their question. The reason they're asking you this question is to make you basically go away. It's a defense mechanism, so know that. And you know this by this. The moment you start answering the question, they interrupt you with another question. So they're just trying to get you to leave them alone. Years ago, uh, when Jonathan was a little boy, we would go to this restaurant and get breakfast, and this one waitress, I don't know why, but she just smothered him with attention. She pinch his cheek and give him hugs. And, and the whole time he was in a high chair at this point, and he's about 18. And no, he wasn't, he was just a little guy. He's in the high chair still, and she would say these things to him, and, and under his breath he was muttering something, going, bah, 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 bah. and he just said it the whole time she was smothering him with affection. And finally one day I said, Jonathan, what are you saying to that waitress? And he said, go bye-bye. So the whole time, the whole time she thought, he loved it. He was saying, leave me alone. And that's what some non-believers are doing. You come up with your gospel guns loaded. You start talking about Christ. And under their breath, they're saying, go boy, boy. So we got to get past that hurdle and be prepared to answer whatever question they ask. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent and study to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope you have. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. I find it interesting he points out your good behavior in Christ. Listen to this. If you're not living it, all the preaching in the world is not going to help at all. So first you earn the right to share your faith by living your faith and being a good example. But it's interesting because the phrase that Peter uses there for giving an answer comes from the Greek word apologia. And this is where we get our English word apologetic from. Apologetic does not mean that we're apologizing for our faith. It's a term that means to give a logical explanation. It's actually a legal term that conveys the idea of giving a defense as in a court of law. And contrary to what some people may think, Christianity is actually a very logical belief. <laughs> to be a Christian, we don't have to check our brains at the door. God says in Isaiah 118, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Or as another translation puts it, and I love it, God says, come let us argue this out, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. 
So there is logic, but it's not purely logic. There is an element, a great element of faith that's involved in following Jesus Christ. But the fact is, when I started reading the Bible, for the first time in my life, the whole world began to make sense. Because I thought, well, man's basically good, and I don't, why, don't know why he does all these bad things, and I don't know why all these bad things happen in life. But when I read the Bible and realized that man is not basically good, in fact, he's very sinful. He, he's bad to the bone, right? And when I discovered that not only is there a God who loves us, but a Satan who hates us, things started coming into a clearer focus for me. C.S. Lewis said, and I quote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. See, when you study and read the Bible and you get what we call a biblical worldview, you will be able to interpret so many things now with a proper theology. And I think the problem is a lot of people don't think biblically. They think emotionally. But we have to let the Bible be our guide in our decisions and our beliefs and in the things that we say and we do. So we are to give a legal defense. But having said that, you are to be a witness, not a prosecuting attorney. And I've seen some people share their faith heavy-handed, um, like with a sledgehammer. And remember this, if you want to win people to Christ, you need to be loving and gracious and winsome. Let me sum it up a different way. If you want to win some, you need to be winsome. Be nice. And I've seen people that they're right. What they're saying is true, but they're yelling it in a person's face or, or they're full of anger. That's not the way to reach a non-believer. We need to do it with kindness. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servants must not quarrel, but be kind to everyone, gently teaching those who oppose the truth. And perhaps God will change these, people heart, these people's hearts and they'll believe the truth then they will come to their senses. So, you know, the prime example of this is Christ himself. If anyone could have stood on a soapbox and wagged his finger at people who are not believers, it would have been Jesus. Jesus was God. Jesus was perfect. Yet who showed more grace and love to sinful people than Christ himself? He was called the friend of sinners. And the classic example is clearly John 4, when we see Jesus with the immoral woman at the well. You know, he's waiting there for her at, at the heat, in the heat of the day, 12 o'clock noon, as she comes to draw water. And the reason she came at that hour was because uh, that was the only time she could draw water because the other ladies were there earlier and she had been ostracized. She was a social outcast because this woman had been married and divorced five times and she was living with the guy. But who's waiting for her but Jesus? And he could have said, hey you, heathen woman, come here. I'm God and you're not. Repent. Would that have been accurate? Yes. Would that have been loving? Not so much. But instead he starts with a question. Hey, would you give me a drink of water? He starts a conversation. And this is the thing when you're sharing your faith. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. I've seen Christians tell others about Christ robotically. It's like you push a button and they just start talking. They never come up for air. And that's okay when you're preaching to a group of people, maybe. But when you're having a conversation with someone, it's give and take. It's a dialogue. Listen to what they have to say and appropriately apply the message of the gospel. And Jesus certainly did that and we should do the same thing. Sometimes a great way to talk with people is to ask them questions. I've told you before. Everyone's favorite subject is themselves. We, people love to talk about themselves. So I'll ask a person and I'll listen and I'll learn a lot about them. And, and then they'll ask me a question and then I'll share what I believe. You know, I told you the story before of a cab driver that picked me up and his name was Tom and we're driving down the road and, and we drove by something called a ghost bike. And that's a bike that's been painted white to commemorate a road biker, a road cyclist who had been killed there. And I commented on it and I said, wow, look, someone was killed there. He says, oh, people are killed in this road all the time. I said, that's horrible. He even told me he had a friend who died on that road. So I asked him a question. Tom, tell me, what do you think happens after we die? 
And Tom says, well, I think that when you die, you, you come back as a higher or a lower life form depending on what kind of karma you have. I listened. I didn't interrupt him. I didn't say, that's so stupid. <laughs> I just listened. Did I agree? No, not at all. But I listened. And he was all done. And then he said, well, what do you think happens after you die? Well, I'm glad you asked. See, so I started with a question. I heard his point of view. Now he's going to hear my point of view. Then I shared the gospel with him. And then he said to me, you know what? I like your version of the afterlife better than mine. I said, well, Tom, it's not my version. It's what Jesus said. And then I took it to the next level. See, sometimes when you're talking with people, you'll find out they don't want to really go any further with you. And by the way, I don't push it. If I'll start a conversation and a person's interested, I'll go to the next level. If they don't want to go there, I'll just stop. And I'll back off a little bit because I think it's very important that you pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit when you're talking with people. Sometimes God wants you to sow a seed, and that's it. Sometimes God wants you to water a seed that someone else has sown. And sometimes God wants you to reap where others have sown and watered. So you establish that dialogue. Jesus often answered questions with questions. One day a rich young ruler, as we call him, came up to Jesus, a very accomplished young man, uh, was a leader in Israel, but a very young man. He would have been very wealthy, very powerful. And uh, he pull, came up to Jesus and pulled up in his probably, you know, BMW chariot, I don't know, but uh, said, hey, you know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now you would think Jesus would have said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to do A, B, C, and D. But instead Jesus says, well, why do you call me good? There's not one good except God. Wait, what? Why wouldn't you reel that boy in? Uh, why would you say something like that? Jesus answered a question with a question to draw him out. Jesus also did this when he was supposedly being painted into a corner by the religious leaders. And they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because the people back then, as now, were horribly overtaxed. And Jesus said, someone give me a coin. And they produced a coin. He held it up and he said, whose face is on this coin? They said, Caesar's. He said, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and give to God the things that belong to God. He took a question. He responded with a question. So here's how it works. You're talking to someone about Jesus and they say, well, wait, hold on. I believe Jesus was a great moral teacher. And really that's their way of saying, I don't think Jesus is God. I don't think he's the only way to God. I think he was a, a great teacher and a great example. So instead of arguing with that, say, do you? And which of his teachings do you like the best? Well, they're probably not going to have an answer. Because the person that says, I believe Jesus was a great moral teacher, what, what are his teachings that you love so much? Well, they don't have any. See, they're trying to get rid of you. So if you dialogue with them and you draw them out, you're taking them out of their comfort zone. But it won't be long when you're sharing your faith before you're going to be hit with some of these questions and others. But one will be, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? You know, people will say the Bible's full of contradictions. That's why it's good to have a Bible nearby. Because I love to say, really, I wish you'd show me one. And I'm telling you, 99 times out of 100, they won't be able to. It's just a way to make you go bye-bye, right? But occasionally, they might have a, a fairly interesting question that can be answered. But why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? The Bible contradicts itself. The Bible was written by men. You've heard that, right? How do you answer that question? Number two, what about the person who has never heard the gospel? What about the person living in the middle of the jungle? I don't know why they're always in a jungle or in the middle of a desert. Will God send them to hell? And I like to respond by asking, well, why do you ask that? Do you believe that the gospel is true? And by the way, you have heard the gospel or you're hearing it right now. But what about the person who's never heard the gospel? Will God, or as it's often framed, will a God of love send them to hell? And thirdly, if God is so good and loving, why does he allow evil? This is one of the biggest questions. So we gotta get this one down. Why does a God of love allow evil? Why would he allow a baby to be born with a disability? Why, why would he allow the Holocaust? Why does he allow tragedy? Okay, there's a lot of questions like this and more. So we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper right now and, and bring out these three guys to help you. But first we're gonna show you a video and these are some 
uh, people on the street just asking their questions about God. And then Jason, Jonathan, and Chad will come out and answer your questions. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. So look at the screen right now. When was Christianity created? My question is, what came before that and prior to that? Anything else? or Why can't we see God now? Why doesn't he walk on the earth now? And why doesn't he make it so easy for people to believe in him? Why doesn't he intervene in you know our lives today and you know say, hey, I'm here? If you commit a sin, if you're a serial killer, if you're a rapist, I understand if you accept God and you believe in God, you can get into heaven. But I mean, what about the sinister people? What about the people that really just have hate in their heart? Concern that I have, especially with it, is that that's written by human beings by you know thousands of years ago. And one thing that also kind of concerns me is could that have been possibly corrupted in the 2,000 years that um, that book has existed? I, I see, think there's a lot of problems with it just because it was written by man and there's problems with man. What you said is how do we know that Jesus Christ was real? Is, is he real? Does he exist? I can't say that I've ever had, you know, God, I guess, speak to me, but I think um, if that somehow were to happen, then maybe I would believe, but as of right now, I'm just going off of what I've learned about the world and how it kind of just doesn't really add up. Is what is good good because God commands it, or does God command it because it's good? There's nothing that proves it though, and it's hard to prove anything, but there was just nothing that that proves it though, so that's the biggest thing. If somebody could just rise from the dead, I mean, why can't we just rise from the dead? All righty, well, hello, and we are glad to be joining you. As Pastor Greg was just mentioning, we thought we would take a few moments to answer your questions. And uh, we have been already getting a bunch of questions that have been texted in, and I wanted to put up on the screen that number for you uh, one more time. And we are getting live text questions on our phones, and so you can uh, text any question that you potentially heard out on the street, or maybe a question that you are personally dealing with. You know, last week we talked about kind of being ready in season and out of season, going, God, if you want to use me, here I am, and, uh, and I will do my best. And so tonight our goal, me, Jonathan, and Chad, is to simply give you some uh, quick answers to difficult questions. So these aren't going to be super exhaustive. We're not going to give you like the, the Webster's Dictionary or like some deep theological answer. We're going to make it short and sweet. And our hope is that you would take these little bits that we give you and you could use them uh, in your conversations to come. So if you want more, you know, you can talk to us after service and we'll go much deeper. Um, but right now we're going to try to do the difference between snorkeling and scuba diving. All right, tonight we're going to be snorkeling. And if you want more, you can ask us about scuba diving later. And so we're going to just touch the surface of some of these big questions that we've received. And uh, one of the questions that Pastor Greg ended with was he asked about suffering and evil and God's existence. How can God exist when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? And I'm going to throw it to Chad. Chad, what, what would you say to that question? Uh, usually when someone presents me with that question, I'll, uh, I'll try and get them to consider maybe the flip side of that for a moment there. I mean, in a sense, they, they think that, you know, somehow evil exists and, and that's proof that God does not exist. But I would say that if such a thing like evil does exist, that's, that's proof that there is a God. I mean, think about it. If there is no God, if you have a friend that's maybe dying of a disease and, and they're gone. I, I've met people where they said, you know, they're, they're gone. I'm never going to see them again. Where was God? God doesn't exist. And it's like, well, think about what you're saying right now. You know, if God does not exist, that means that something evil didn't really happen. Your friend was just the byproduct matter of this universe, the, the fabric of it, the furniture of it. They're gone. You'll never see them again. And somehow you just need to get over that. There's, there's no hope in that whatsoever. And the reality is, is that, you know, God doesn't want people to suffer. He doesn't want hurting. Look at the price that he was willing to pay, uh, the highest price he could possibly pay at the cross with his son's blood to do something about this problem. So usually what I'll do, if they, they really got a problem with evil or suffering in the world, and, they, and I say, you, you think that God should rid this problem. He should just do away with evil in the world. I ask him, you know, you got to watch, you got the time. What do you got? I do. What time do you got on your iPad there? 801. All right. So I ask him, if God were to eradicate all the evil and suffering uh, in the world at 802, my question is, what would happen to you? 
Uh -oh. We want God to do something about all the evil in the world, but what if he starts with us? And so we want God to do something about the evil, but why isn't he doing something about this? It's, it's his patience. I, I'm thankful that he waited at least till March 14th, you know, 2007. That was the night uh, that I got saved. And he holds out for other people as well. But in Acts chapter 17, it says that he has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And so really it's God's patience. It's his long suffering, his forbearance, why he allows these things to go on. Uh, but this certainly isn't the garden uh, of Eden that he uh, had intended. Uh, this isn't the best possible earth, but the best possible way to the best possible earth. That's right. Hey, that's a great answer. And I thought I would start out with a real difficult one. Okay, that's definitely one of the biggies that people often ask on the street. You know, if, if God is good, then why suffering and evil? And so, hey, that was a great answer. And you can go back and watch the podcast or watch the video, okay, to get that, uh, to soak that in. Now, for those of you real quick, I want to make a comment. Did all of you receive this when you walked in tonight? Okay, well, you can get it on your way out. Uh, the idea here is we're giving you questions to ask different religions and worldviews. And so you're not always on the defense. You can now be on the offense. And so in this little resource I'm giving you for free, it gives you different things to say to a Catholic or a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or an atheist or an agnostic. And so it's helping you be proactive because I have found, you know, being on the street quite a bit, you know, in sharing my faith, when I ask people, questions, it causes them to, you know, really consider why they believe what they believe. And so utilize this resource. We're hooking you up with it. All right. So I got 17 questions about the Bible. And one of them uh, really just continue to see over and over again. It's Jonathan, has the Bible changed over time? No, it hasn't. And uh, one thing that's so cool is just recently at the Qumran caves over there in the Dead Sea, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and these are manuscripts that are thousands of years old from what we had originally found, which was what, the, when were the Qumran caves actually discovered? That little boy thrown 1947, I believe, around So in the there. 40s, the, the ones we had before that were hundreds of years recorded later. So this little boy throws this rock, and he finds all these manuscripts of the, the, um, the book of Isaiah, and just recently, even more were discovered. And more, even more were found. And I'm going to go ahead and take a stab in the dark here and say they again confirm that Scripture is accurate. And that manuscripts we have today, the copies we have today that we have on our phones and in our Bibles, are going to confirm with incredible accuracy what the Bible has to say. And everything from the verbiage to the nouns, the way the sentences are structured, it's all going to be there. Yeah, generally when people ask me, is the Bible changed? I go, nope, moving on. They go, okay, yeah, it works. And the evidence is there. Again, these are snorkeling answers, but uh, the Bible has definitely not been changed uh, throughout the years. Uh, one question over and over again was, who made God? And when you get asked that question, it's real easy. Just you go, well, what do you mean? So, like, well, who made God? I'm like, I don't think you understand who God is. That's like asking, like, what does orange weigh? And what does the musical note C taste like? It, God is eternal by nature. He has no beginning, no end. So God was the unmade. He's got no beginning, no end. Good question with an easy answer, okay? It's simple. Nobody made God. He's always been. Everlasting to everlasting, we're told, and by, the, uh, by the psalmist. That's right. So another question here was about all the religions in the world. And either one of you guys can jump on this. They say, how can Christianity be true if there's so many religions out there? I think that's really just how truth is by nature. And that's the, the big question, really. Is Christianity true? And we believe it's true, not based off of our own opinion, not based off of our own authority, but based off of the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. He says that everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me, and we all know where he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, so that's a, an either or there. You know, either it's true that he really is the only way, excluding all other options. Isn't that how truth is? If two plus two equals four, doesn't it exclude all the other possibilities out there? There's a lot of things that two plus two is not. And so if Jesus really is the only way, well, then that's the truth right there. Uh, the big question is whether or not this is true or not. And so they can try and argue with you over it. Uh, there's a funny quote that I want to pull up here in terms of people that sometimes try and say that 
All religions basically say the same thing. Uh, this is a quote by Steve Turner. It's Modern Thinker's Creed. Uh, he says, and I'm just kind of uh, paraphrasing some of this here. He says, we believe in Marx, Freud, Darwin, and we believe everything is okay. As long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your de definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. Jesus was a good man, just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, though we think his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the ones that we read were. Uh, they all believe in love and goodness. They only differ in matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. I would say all religions out there are pretty mutually exclusive, right? They all make yeah. that unique truth claim. But I would say if you look at this person, Jesus of Nazareth, never a man spoke like this man. Uh, he not only had this earthly ministry, he lived this per holy, perfect, sinless life where he says, which of you, to the Pharisees, can accuse me of sin? And they were silenced. And then he declares that, I'm going to go to that cross and watch. I'm going to raise his body again, you know, three days later. And uh, one unique thing about Christianity in that sense is that it's, it's empirically falsifiable. Think about if Jesus says, you know, I'm going to raise spiritually from the dead. They would never be able to disprove it. He gave them an opportunity. All they had to do three days later was produce the body. If they could show the body, even the Apostle Paul, he says, hey, look, if Christ, if he was not risen again from the dead, our faith is in vain and we are to be most pitied. And so Christianity really puts it out there. Uh, whether or not it's true, Jesus says, look, I'm going to give you some empirically falsifiable proof right now. If you could produce his body inside that tomb, it's not true. The body's not there because we know where he is. He's at the right hand of the Father. Yeah, that's really good. One thing funny that I do when people ask that question, you know, how do we know, you know, which religion is true? I generally say, hey, do you have a dollar bill on you? Or I'll point to a ring if they've got like a diamond ring on. I go, how do I know that this dollar bill isn't fake? And I give it to them. They go, well, because, you know, it, it's not fake. It looks real. I'm like, how do you know it's not fake? Well, because of like the things in it that kind of show. There's evidences that show it's true. I say, now let me think for a moment. How many counterfeits exist for the $100 bill? They're like thousands. The very fact that counterfeits exist shows that they're pointing toward what? An authentic, a real one. I said, rather, all the religions in the world are just counterfeits. Some of them are really good, some of them are really bad, but they're all pointing toward a real, authentic one, and Jesus, again, he is the real one. He's the real deal. He's the authentic. He's the mint. And uh, from all else, we can see that they all fall short, you know, and Jesus alone steps out of the grave, and that's the greatest hope we have, you know, that he conquered the grave, and so can we, uh, because of what he's done for us. So that's a really good question, and so thank you uh, for whoever texted that in. All right, so we got another one that was recently uh, text in, and it said, is Jesus real? And then it was followed up, what time is he going to show up here tonight? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Oh, there he is, walking in the back door. Um, yes, he's real, and he's here, uh, but you guys want to add on that? Is Jesus real? How do we know that he was a real guy and not just some, like, fable or myth? Yeah, sometimes, you know, people look at the Bible as if it's, it's one book, but it's not one book, is it? It's, it's 66 books that have been basically brought together underneath one binding. And so these books, really, you can look at them as historical documents, and so they really are their earliest sources. Like when it comes to Alexander the Great, you know, sometimes you, know, you might wonder, did Alexander the Great ever really exist? And, you know, in, in the college history departments, they'll say, absolutely he existed. Well, what are the best sources we have to determine whether or not uh, he existed? And they have uh, a couple historians by the name of Arian Plutarch. These guys wrote over 500 years later after the life of Alexander the Great. And yet historians say that we could go back and we can reconstruct and discover that, you know, this guy Alexander the Great really did exist. And he conquered, you know, most of the, the known world. When it comes to Jesus of Nazareth, uh, nothing compares. We have the earliest sources, eyewitness testimony. Not just eyewitness testimony, but multiple eyewitnesses to declare what he said was true. When you think about like a car accident and you wonder, okay, what happened in this intersection here? It's great if you have one eyewitness, but if you have multiple eyewitnesses that are all corroborating the same story, uh, you've hit what they call, uh, you know, pay dirt. You've got some bedrock right there. And so like I said, nothing compares to it in ancient history. Uh, there's eyewitness testimony, uh, multiple witness attestation. Uh, it's the earliest documents that we have, and there's a multiplicity uh, of these documents that are out there. Thousands of manuscripts, over 5,600 Greek manuscripts that all point to saying the same thing, the same things that we discover uh, within the Qumran caves. These things do not change. Yeah, that's really great. You know, and even there's 
people outside of the Bible that talk about Jesus existing, you know? And so it's not just in the Bible where we have people talking about this guy from Nazareth. You know, we've got, you know, which Jonathan, you mentioned a few weeks ago in one of your studies about Josephus. You know, Josephus mentioned Jesus. You know, also got guys like Pliny the Younger and Suetonius, some of these early historians writing about this guy uh, named Jesus. And so he definitely was a historical figure. Heck, we even our timetables, you know, B.C. and A.D., you know, it's all about uh, Jesus himself. So, yeah, Jesus. What they, call, they call that enemy attestation when you have somebody that's basically a non-Christian, right, like a, a Greco-Roman or, or Jewish historian that will at least attest to the reality that Jesus did exist. Uh, this is a criteria when you're trying to discover whether or not something is historical. They call it enemy attestation. It adds a lot more weight to the reality that it's true. For instance, you know, if Jason's mom says, you know, I think my Jason, he's a pretty <laughs> tough boy, right, like he could really – Knock somebody out with his right hand. It's like, okay, yeah, well, you're his mom. We would kind of expect that to come from you. But if you had somebody that just can't stand Jason, they, they hate his guts. Like, just, oh, forget this guy. I don't even want to spend, you know, catch me outside, bro. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> that guy, he can knock somebody out with his right hand. Doesn't it add a lot more weight when you have the enemy attesting to the reality? And so that's what you get with these uh, historians out there. So That's really great. Catch him outside. All righty, so I, I, Jonathan, question for you. So it's now coming down to some Bible doctrine, and Jesus made a claim, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he even goes on, this person wrote uh, the question, uh, quoting John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. They say, what does that mean? It means that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one being. You know, it's kind of hard for our human brains to comprehend, kind of like Jason, you mentioned the illustration of how much does orange weigh. It's hard for our brains to wrap our minds around God who is eternal, who is everlasting to everlasting, and who uh, existed before everything. So how can we wrap our minds around God? Well, this is just another step of that, the Trinity, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they existed together. Jesus is God, but he is God the Son. And we have God the Father, who's the creator, who's the God in heaven. He's Yahweh. And then we have God the Holy Spirit, who dwells inside of us. And so they are all intercommunicating. They are all each other, but they are all not each other. They all have their unique personalities, their own individual identities, but they're all part of the Godhead. Yeah, that's really good. And people often ask about God because, well, he's the most interesting being in the universe. And so they want to know about him. And there's a lot of questions that are coming in about God. I wanted to put the number up one more time, uh, just in case you're sitting there and something has triggered a question in your heart or in your mind. We're going to put the number up again so we can get more uh, of your questions. And so here it is on the screen behind me. So you can log this away and text this number at any time. It goes directly to Jonathan's cell phone. <laughs> and so you can call him in the middle of the night and uh, he will answer. Love it. Right. Someone asked, how do I witness to my coworker? Well, I would say you start with saying hi. Uh, <laughs> my name's so and so. I work at the same company as you. Uh, you be nice, okay? Start a conversation. And then remember Hangelism from last week. You all remember Hangelism? No, you don't. Okay, well, I'm going to show you a slide. Look at this. Jog your memory. Five, four, three, two, one. Anyway, Hangelism, <laughs> you're going to simply just invite them out to church. And then you're going to ask them a main question. If you were to die today, where would you go? Or what do you think is the meaning to life? Get them to rethink what they believe and why they believe it. And then preach the gospel. And then get them to respond to it. It's very easy to preach the gospel to a coworker or a family member. And it all starts with a simple invite. I would like to invite you out to my church. I'd like to invite you out to a Bible study. And just see where it goes from there. Buy their lunch, you know. Bless them and kind of see how the ball unravels. Yeah. Let me play devil's advocate here. How do you cross that line? Where do you set that line when you know perhaps this is, you work at a secular workplace as many of you do that are here tonight and you're coming here because you want to hear about God and you want to bring your friends to church but maybe you know that your boss is an atheist or you know that your coworker has a lot of animosity towards Christians and he's looking for you to bring faith into the workplace which maybe is a no-no. How do you walk that line? How do you do that? How do you invite that person to church? Or rather, better yet, how does it come from you? How do you witness to that person? Do you do it in the workplace? And do you uh, risk your job and your well-being and your, your income? Or do you just 
Pray that God works it out. Where do you walk that line? I worked at a heavy equipment rental yard, and I started working there, and there was a bunch of, like, heathens that I was working with, the mechanics, the, like, burly, gnarly guys. And uh, I was first living out the Christian life, and so I wasn't cussing. I, I wasn't viewing wrong things. I was on time. I was a hard worker. They saw my work ethic and my attitude. I wasn't talking behind the boss's back. You know, I was... I was a good Christian guy, you know, and all of a sudden that shone, that was really a bright light in a dark place. But then when we would go on like little car rides together for the job, I would ask questions. I would say, so, I mean, have you ever thought about like death? If you were to die today, where would you go? Or what do you think is the meaning to life? I'm telling you, it's easy to strike conversations with questions. Pastor Greg mentioned it. You know, you don't have to know that much, but if you ask good questions, oh man, it it is like the, the world is your oyster. And conversations just seemed to flow with ease. And so I would ask questions to people. And what I saw was that people came to Christ, you know, and they were interested. People like to talk about these things. If you're not weird or awkward or strange, okay, if you're normal, people will talk to you about God. And it'll go well. It really, really will. Okay, so we just got a a bunch of questions uh, that just came in. It said, my father-in-law is legally blind. And he has had kidney failure. He doesn't believe he has much life left. So he wants to live life in the way that he wants to. How do I start the conversation? How do I communicate that life, God's way, is much better uh, than what he's currently living? I think that those types of conversations, uh, they could be really difficult to get started. Because, you know, look where your motive is, where your heart is. is, You know, you want to know that you know, when this person dies, that, you know, though a, a man or woman may die, they shall live, as Christ says. And it, it could be so difficult to get the conversation going, especially if they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, they kind of just shut you out. And so uh, here's something I guess you could say that's in, you know, my tool bag, and, and I want to share it with, with you guys. Whenever I encounter a situation where I think, you know, this could get kind of volatile, or, or you know, this is going to be very difficult to share the gospel with this person, they might shut me out right away. I try to get the motive out there right away. I want them to know uh, that I, I really do care about them. I, I really do love them. And so we're all familiar with, or most of us are probably familiar with Penn Gillette. Uh, he was on that program that, uh, you know, the president once ran, The Apprentice. Uh, he's a, a magician illusionist that you see out in Las Vegas. And this guy is not a Christian. Uh, he is an outspoken atheist, ardent atheist. He speaks out against it. But uh, he's gone online, and you can check this out when you go home. He's put out a, a, a video called Gift of a Bible. And in this video, I'll just kind of paraphrase for you. I know the gist of what he says. He says, you know, I I don't respect people who don't proselytize. He's talking about evangelizing. He's talking about Christians. He says, I don't respect that at all. How much do you have to, he questions, how much do you have to hate somebody in order to believe that everlasting life is possible and not share that with them? He says, how much do you have to hate somebody in order to believe that, you know, they can have this everlasting life? He says, you know... (laughs) If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was bearing down on you and you're in the street and I'm yelling at you, get out of the way, but you're not listening. He says, there comes a certain point where I will tackle you out of the street. And then he goes back to this. He says, and this is more important than that. You know, that's your great commission coming really from somebody who is an atheist. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually share that quote, you know, because that's sort of some common ground I might have with somebody. You know what Penn is. And, hey, can you believe this crazy video he's put out there? He says this thing. And they're usually nodding their head like, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. Think about that. And then you, you throw in there, look, it's because I don't hate you. It's because I love you. You know I'm a Christian. I want to share these things with you. And that's your opener, really, to get into it. And, you know, so far, you know, it's been a successful thing, you know, when, when I've had the opportunity to share it like that. And you're, you're being real. You're being transparent. You're, you're cutting past, you know, a lot of the smoke that sometimes gets in the way. So that's your, your opportunity to get in with the gospel. Serious question here. Can Chuck Norris make a snowman out of the rain? Some of these questions you guys are sending are hilarious, by the way. I mean, how do fat birds stay in the air? A turtle without a shell, is it naked or homeless? (laughs) (laughs) There's quite a few questions coming in about family members that are Catholic or being raised as a Catholic. And the question is, what do I talk to them about? How do I share Christ with a Catholic family member? 
What would you guys say? There's one mediator, mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. Catholics believe that you have to go to Mary, you have to pray to Mary to get to God. Catholics believe that you have to do a number of things to achieve salvation. They believe that basically if you die and you haven't gone to confession, that there's a very good chance that you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. And you might go to that intermediary state, uh, which is called, um, I'm blanking. Purgatory. Purg purgatory, thank you. And basically, the whole reason why we as Christians are Protestant, where that came from, was the Reformers did not believe that you could be bought out of hell. You could not be bought out of purgatory. And they were selling penance. The Catholic Church was basically selling get-out-of-jail-free cards. And they were so against this of what all Scripture taught that they protested against it and started the Protestant movement. And that's what we are here at Harvest. We're Christians. That's what the Christian faith is. So that's what the difference would be. But a good conversation to have with them would be, listen, you know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's one mediator between God and man. That is the man, Christ Jesus. We can communicate with God, not because of our own goodness. We can't talk to God because God is perfect. We are not Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is our ambassador. We come to the Father because we can come to the Son. Jesus does that on our behalf. You know, what I've discovered, too, is that a lot of uh, folks that would say I'm a, you know, card-carrying member, you know, Roman Catholic, they don't know, you know, some of the, what we would say, you know, the bizarre, uh, aberrant beliefs are, you know, that they subscribe to. And so if you take them to a place where it says, you know, Jesus is the only mediator or, you know, I'll, I'll turn them to... You know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, by grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't do anything to add to the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Usually their response is, I totally agree with that. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't think you know what's being taught in the place that you're going to. And so I think a good starting point is sometimes maybe, you know, not assume, you know, that they subscribe to all of these aberrant beliefs, but take them to scripture, say, if this is what you believe, uh, then you need to kind of check out some of the other things that are being taught where you go. And, uh, you know, why don't you come with me on a Thursday night over to uh, Harvest and, and check out some biblical teaching where we open up the Word of God. That's a great, I love that. Amen. All right, so we are getting close to wrapping up, and so we're going to kind of do like uh, some quick ones, uh, even though we're trying to do them all quick. Uh, God, I can't see him. Why should I believe in him? Okay, well, you <laughs> Like, uh. Jesus of Nazareth was God in a bod, so, uh, you know, he could have been seen there, <laughs> right? We can't go back and see, you know, certain figures of history, but we certainly do believe that they exist. I mean, are they skeptical that George Washington uh, was ever really the first president of the United States? And then when it comes to a God that caused all the material world to come into existence, by nature he must be immaterial, right? G John 4, 24, God is spirit, so how would they expect to see immaterial? Why would they expect to see immaterial? You, you can't see the immaterial that caused this universe to come into existence. So uh, there's just, I guess, a couple different avenues that I but would But yet, there. I mean, we are told that, you know, if you put these two ingredients together, you can, you know, have a, a sense of God. If you, if you have faith and repentance, mm -hmm. you know, it says that his spirit will confirm with your spirit that you indeed are sons of God. Mm -hmm. You know, and I found that, you know, though I was not raised in a, like, a complete secular home or anything, uh, you know, I went to church occasionally. I drifted away from my belief in God. And then there came a point where I put my faith and trust in Jesus, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt, God is real. You know, my intellect was not necessarily what I was using there. It was my, my, my soul, it's what the text says, his soul confirmed, or his spirit confirmed with mine that I was indeed a son of God. And, and I would say that anybody really wants to find God, well, believe and repent. Okay, and you will find uh, that he indeed is Experience real. Experience him, yeah. yeah. Even the laws of logic, I mean, we believe in laws of logic. Can you pull five pounds of logic out of the refrigerator, though? No, you can't see, you know, these laws. Or same thing with the laws of mathematics or the laws of science. So there's plenty of things in life that we believe in uh, that we don't see with our eyes. Does God still heal today? What do you guys think? Jonathan? Yeah, absolutely. He renews us from the inside out, first of all. I mean, we have definitely seen supernatural healings. I know many of you have seen supernatural healings take place in this church. Have we seen a man who's been maimed grow back a limb? Perhaps not on that aspect, but my question would be, 
what is the greater healing, a physical healing like that or the healing of death? We've been freed from death. God cured the greatest disease when Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Death died when Christ rose. That was the greatest disease of all mankind plaguing us and also the disease of sin, which separates us from God, which separates us from eternal life in heaven with God. So that was definitely the greatest disease, bringing it big picture here. I've committed a lot of horrible sins. Will God really forgive me? I'd say don't flatter yourself and never think that you could ever commit a sin that could possibly outweigh the blood yeah. of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's a really good one. And that person's written in multiple times. And I can just tell you, you know, just putting your faith in Christ, you will find 1 John 1, 9. You know, he's going he's gonna to wipe you clean. And, and that guilt and that shame will be wiped away. Your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, man. So, yeah, definitely the Lord will forgive you like he's done uh, to us. Okay, so now wrapping this thing up here, someone says, what does it take to get to heaven? Seems basic enough, all right? Like you're setting me up. That's like a softball on a tee, okay? Like what does it take to get to heaven? Okay, you ready for this one? It takes you believing some simple things. One, that God exists. That he's revealed himself in the God-man, Jesus Christ. That Jesus really was alive. He really walked this planet, lived a perfect life. And then he went to a cross. The Bible says, out of great love for you, Jesus died on the cross in your place. Jesus took the punishment you deserve. We are guilty before the creator of the universe. We have disobeyed him. You have sinned. You've done wrong. And really, you deserve to be up on that cross. You deserve to spend eternity in hell. But God, in great love for us, sent Jesus to die for us. He died in our place. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. Three days later, the tomb was empty. You know, the Bible makes it really clear that by trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone, you can have the confidence that you go to heaven when you die. It's actually like you're getting hooked up with something. You know, really, the reason why heaven is so special is because God is there. And so God is saying, look, you can spend the rest of eternity with me if you believe in the very thing that I did for you. That he's extending to you love and mercy and grace. And if you don't want it, you can definitely step over the, the dead body of Christ, the living body of Christ to get to hell if you want to. But God so loved you, he did these things to prove that he's, his love for you is enough and that's what you need. And that by trusting in him, you can have your sin forgiven. You can go to heaven when you die. And, and these things, well, they're true. And the Bible talks about it. And, you know, even wrapping this up right now, I'm confident that though not every question got answered and there were hundreds that literally got asked, I know this, that there are probably some of you here tonight that your question did get an answered. But even this specific one about what does it take to get to heaven? Well, maybe that's you here tonight. Let me ask you, if you were to die today, where would you go? Are you confident you go to heaven? If not, would you like to be confident? You can have that confidence by believing in Jesus, that he loved you, died for you, and he rose again from the dead. And today, this living uh, Savior is here today, and he wants a relationship with you. And so what I would like to do is actually close in a word of prayer and give... Some of you have an opportunity to get right with Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your life and forgive you of your sins so you know you could go to heaven if you were to die today. So let's close in a word of prayer, and then I'll give you that opportunity. Lord, I thank you for tonight. Lord, all of these great questions uh, that have been asked. Lord, I, I know that there are many more that people have, and I pray, God, you would uh, have them come up to us and, and ask us personally. We'd love to, to answer. But Lord, tonight there are some here that don't know you, and I pray that right now you'd open their eyes uh, to help them see their need for you. So with their head bowed and their eyes closed, if you tonight are not confident you're right with Jesus, you're not confident if you were to die right now, you would go to heaven. You know your sins are not forgiven, but you would like to be forgiven. You would like to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus to go to heaven when you die. Then I just simply want you to lift your hand in the air and I want to pray for you. I want to give you an opportunity to get right with him. You heard me right. If you would like to get right with Jesus Christ tonight, would you simply lift your hand in the air so that I could pray for you? I've got some hands going on in the back. You're not the only one lifting your hand. God bless you and you in the corner. And maybe you're here tonight and you've gotten astray. You've done some things you know you're not supposed to. You called yourself a Christian, but you've fallen away. 
and you would like to come back to Jesus tonight, if you'd like to rededicate your life to hit the reset button, I want you to lift your hand in the air, and I want to pray for you as well to give you an opportunity to get well, recommitted to him. God bless you and you in the back. Anybody else in this moment, if you'd like to get right with the Lord, God bless you. For all of you that just raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. Right where you're at is I want you to pray this prayer after me. This is not a prayer that saves you. This is a commitment from your heart you're making to the Savior, and he's going to hear you, and he's going to come in. But would you, you pray this prayer with me now? Would you say it from your mouth and mean it in your heart? The prayer is, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you came and you died for me and God rose you from the dead. Jesus, would you be my savior? Would you be my friend? Would you wash away my sins? I turn from them now. I put my trust in you, Jesus. I need you. I'm committed to you. Help me follow you for the rest of my days. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.